Hey guys, um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about microbe human interactions, infectious interactions, both infection and disease. Um, so we'll have at it. It should be a pretty quick one. Again, it's pretty basic stuff, a lot of definitions, nothing too crazy. So without any further ado, let's uh, get started. All right, so the first thing we need to talk about is the human host. Um, so generally, an infection is seen in three different parts. Contact, so coming in contact with the pathogen. Infection, the pathogen breaking through our protective mechanisms and getting inside of our body and setting up shop. And then disease, and this is where you have a persistent infection that has pretty much taken over. And it's a continuum of sorts. So it's not an all-or-nothing process. Um, generally, you can have contact and infection almost simultaneously, depending on where that um, pathogen's infecting or how s what big of a wound you have or whatever the case may be. Oops, this stupid box keeps getting in the way. All right. So body surfaces are constantly exposed to microbes. I mean, we've learned that time and time again from both doing some things in the lab and just by me telling you um, there are microbes everywhere. They're ubiquitous and 99% of them are not pathogenic but there are a few that are. And so it is our body's process to constantly fight off or prevent the pathogenic ones from setting up shop inside of our body. But we're not perfect and inevitably these pathogens have unique or developed unique ways to kind of get around our immune system and our body's defenses and eventually that leads to infection. And this is the pathogenic microorganism penetrates the host defense, says enter the tissues and then multiply. So pathogenic, this is the state that results when the infection damages or disrupts tissues and organs. And infectious disease, the disruption of tissues or organs caused by microbes or their products. So. We all have resident microbiota. We have tons of normal microbiota. Um, these guys are non-pathogenic, and that is because they live within us, but they don't take advantage of us. As soon as they take advantage of us and try to take more than we want to give them, they become pathogens. So for cell for cell, microbes on the human body outnumber human cells at least 10 to 1. So there are tons of microbes on our skin, in our digestive tract, in our nose, everywhere with a few exceptions um, being the brain the reproductive tract at least in males especially the testes the eye and the lower lungs but other than that you can find microbes usually on a fairly regular basis so metagenomics, this is the uh, ability for us to do deep sequencing of all the DNA in our body, both humans and microbes, and then taking that, that information and searching known databases and trying to figure out what microbes are present in our body. And we've discovered that it's not as consistent as we thought it would be. So certain people are infected with certain microbes and that's what makes their immune system slightly different or makes them slightly different um, but so this is like a whole new hot button topic in science right now uh, people are loving this metagenomics and the human microbiome project and all this good stuff it's it's pretty cool and how do we acquire resident microbiota so we get these from the environment generally we can also get them from our mothers um, and occasionally from our fathers so normal microbiota you can see pretty much everywhere skin adjacent mucous membranes respiratory tract gastrointestinal tract outer opening urethra external genitalia vagina external air canal external eyelids and so on so they're normally present in and on the body human cells <clears throat> in an adult is about 10 trillion bacteria is about 100 trillion so there's a tenfold increase so there's a lot of microbiota Primarily found externally, both on the skin and eyes. Um, they're everywhere. <laughs> Internally, um, nose, mouth, intestinal tract, vagina, and urethra. Um, especially the intestinal tract. That's where the majority of 
microbiota, at least internally, are located. So resident microbes, each site has particular populations and it changes over time, and this is even different between person and person. Transient microbes, so these do not normally reside just passing through. Most are harmless, some are pathogens. Um, so pathogens do fit into this category. So all pathogens are transient microbes, but not all transient microbes are pathogens. Um, you can Some transient microbes are things found in like Activa yogurt. There are microbes found in that yogurt. They're not normally found in our gut, but when we take in that yogurt, we bring them in, they set up shop. And nine times out of 10, they don't set up shop for long and they're just passed out through your stool. And then we have the opportunists. So these are all where the pathogens fit in. Um, all pathogens are opportunists and all opportunists are pathogens. That makes sense. Um, they cause disease when given the opportunity, breakdown in immunity, certain medical treatments, and implantations of devices. So these are the guys that like to, to set up shop when your immune system's weakened. Um, a lot of molds, fungi fit into this category. <coughs> Excuse me. Molds, fungi fit in this category. They're ubiquitously found in the environment. If you have a healthy immune system, you're fine. Until something goes wrong with your immune system, then they can kind of take over. So how do we acquire these guys? Through the birth canal, from food, breathing, um, natural succession, just from touching things in our environment. That's where we get our lactobacilli, coliforms, and our anaerobes from. Um, a lot of these guys hang out in soil, so playing in the soil, coming near the soil, touching the soil, all that kind of stuff allows for the natural succession of these. So impact of normal flora, so biological success for the bacteria. So bacteria like being in our gut, it's very nutrient rich, it's enjoyable to them, they get all the vitamins and nutrients and materials and stuff they require. It's also beneficial for us to have normal flora so that we can exclude potential pathogens. If we have a lot of microbiota using up those nutrients that are available, <coughs> it prevents pathogens from getting a hold of them. So that's a kind of a competition. And this competition makes it hard for them to, or for pathogens to set up shop. But also, occasionally, they can provide some nutrients to the host. They can break down things that are hard for our digestive tract to break down and make them smaller and easier to assimilate. They can also improve host nutrition. Vitamin B12 is produced from bacteria. It's a, a byproduct that they, they um, produce, and it's very useful for us. Immune stimulation. So our immune system does recognize these guys as pathogenic, and generally they um, treat them less severely, or they don't harm them as much as they would a normal pathogen. But it does kind of awaken your immune system and make them realize, hey, these are bacteria, we need to recognize that, um, and we need to be prepared to attack bacteria in the future. And also have potential negative impacts, especially in people who are immunocompromised or going through some sort of cancer therapy or such. Um, it can be... Some of these guys have shown, especially people who have AIDS, to have the ability of transforming themselves into pathogenic microbes once the immune system has left, um, primarily by plowing through the intestinal membranes and getting into the blood. So the, these are sites that are thought to be sterile. Um, you can see heart, liver, kidneys, brain, muscle, bone, but I can guarantee you that uh, the good majority of these aren't actually sterile. Um, you'll find some if you really look. <laughs> Generally, the ones that absolutely need to be sterile are the brain and spinal cord. You'll rarely find anything in there, and if you do, you're in, you're in bad shape, along with the ovaries and testes. Again, you shouldn't find anything in there. If you do, you're in bad shape, especially when it comes to sterility. Um, blood, urine, cerebral spinal fluid, these all should be sterile, but again, urine tends to have bacteria in it. It's not necessarily a big deal. And occasionally you'll see some things in blood in like a transient kind of manner, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. So, progress of an infection. So, a pathogen, this is a microbe who, whose relationship with its host is parasitic and results in infection and disease, and generally a breakdown of tissues. Um, and that breakdown of tissues get, uh, releases more nutrients, and the pathogen sucks that up. 
Type and severity infection depends on pathogenicity of the organism and the condition of its host. So the pathogenicity, pathogenicity is how good of a pathogen that microbe is and what it is doing to become that good of a of pathogen. Now, <clears throat> the pathogen can kind of change its things or its virulence factors to make it more pathogenic, but it also has a lot to do with the hosts that they are infecting. Um, generally, there are a group of hosts that are easier to infect, and for that reason, you'll see more pathogenic infections in them. Um, primarily in the old age and extreme young, or string youth, or the young group. <laughs> These are people probably under the age of seven. And I'd say anyone over the age of 70 is in the old age group. And this is primarily because as you get older, or if you're very young, your immune system isn't fully developed. If you're older, your immune system is kind of breaking down, so you're, you generally have a weaker immune system. Genetic defects and immunity, um, there are a lot of them, a lot more than I thought until I got into immunology. Um, not very common, but there are a lot of them. Uh, things like bubble boy syndrome, where you have people who live in a bubble because they have no effective immune system and anything that they come into contact with could be potentially pathogenic. Or you can acquire defects in the immune system, such as AIDS, which is the um, disorder associated with having prolonged HIV infection. Surgery and organ transplant. So anytime you get surgery or organ transplant, you generally go on some kind of immunosuppressive therapy so that your immune system doesn't react to the new organ. Um, but that immunosuppressive therapy does affect your entire immune system, making you more susceptible to other infections. Underlying diseases, cancer, liver malfunction, diabetes, all of these things have effects on your immune system. Chemotherapy, immunosuppressive drugs, again, can weaken your immune system for obvious reasons. They're called immunosuppressive drugs. And then physical and mental stress. So being physically and mentally stressed has been scientifically proven <clears throat> to cause a decrease in your immune system's function. Definitions of terms. So pathogen, this is a microbe that can cause disease in a susceptible individual. Virulence, this is the degree of the ability of a microbe to cause disease in another organism. So the more virulence you have, the more effective you are as a pathogen. Infection, colonization of an organism by another microorganism, or by a microorganism, with or without disease. So I am infected with my normal microbiota. Doesn't necessarily cause disease, but they are setting up shop inside of me. A disease is when it actually causes harm to the host. and starts breaking down tissues. <clears throat> Communicable. This is the ability of a disease-causing organism to be spread between individuals. So this is 99% of our pathogenic diseases. They are transmitted communicably. I cough on you, you get it. That kind of thing. And virulence factors, these are the microbial components that contribute to the ability to cause disease in a susceptible host. So these can be things like toxins, um, <coughs> really nice fimbrae that attach and make them stickier so that they can stick all over the body. Things like that. Things that the microbe has the ability to change to make them more pathogenic. So pathogenicity, so you have two different types. Oops. True pathogens, these are guys that only live as pathogens. They need to infect an organism to survive. And opportunistic pathogens live in the environment, can also live on you or in you, but as soon as your immune system is weakened, that's when they become pathogenic. So virulence is the degree of pathogenicity, determined by its ability to establish itself in the host and cause damage. So the key to being a really good microbe is to cause enough damage to where you can get a lot of extra nutrients released, but not too much damage to where you kill your host. And there's always this kind of fine line you have to dance around. And that's what adjusting your virulence factors allows you to do. And your virulence factors are characteristics or structures of the microbe that contributes to its virulence. Um, so it's, it's easy to remember since it's got virulence in the name. <laughs> Different healthy individuals have widely varying responses to some microorganisms, and that's because hosts evolve, also because we all have slightly different immune systems that respond slightly different to different virulence factors. So the very first bit about becoming infected with a pathogen is establishing or, or getting into the body. 
and that is through a portal of entry. So we have our skin. It's covered with 7 to 10 dead layers of skin cells that have been keratinized. So it's fairly tough. It's fairly robust. So it makes it pretty difficult of a barrier for microbes to get through. But it's not perfect. And we also have portals of entry that are just naturally occurring in our skin, like our mouth, our eyes, um, our anus, our urogenital tract, and that kind of thing. Because we need to be able to excrete things out of our body, we need to be able to communicate, and for that reason we need holes in our skin. <clears throat> and these all become somewhat susceptible to an infection. Um, our body has developed ways to get around this um, by producing things like mucus, or having mucous membranes, or having antibodies being constantly secreted to kind of ward off infection, or ward off these guys from getting in. Um, but there are still ways for bath pathogens to get around these things. So infectious agents that enter the skin, these are generally through nicks, abrasions, and punctures. Intact skin is very tough, like I said. There are only a few um, pathogens that I can think of that actively burrow through the skin to get through it. And they are not bacterial, they are not viral. They are parasitic in origin. And we'll talk about those um, probably in a, two or three weeks. They're pretty cool. And then some create their own pathogen or passageways using digestive enzymes or bites. Gastrointestinal tract is a portal, so pathogens contained in food, drink, and other in ingested substances. These are usually the guys that are transmitted via the fecal oral route, and we'll spend a whole lecture just on these guys. And these adapt to sur surviving digestive enzymes and pH changes. You can see a whole list of guys that are, have the ability of doing this. Salmonella, Shigella, Vibrio, all that good stuff. We'll talk about these in more detail later on. Respiratory tract. Um, so these go through the respiratory tract, obviously. Um, portal for the greatest number of um, pathogens, and that's because it is 